Acts 5, verse 1. Let's all stand up on our feet in honor of the word if you're able to. But there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife Sapphira sold the property. He brought part of the money to the apostles claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, oh snap, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not to sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified, I bet. <laughs> then some of the youth group got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, she was shopping or something. Peter asked her, was this the price you and your husband received for your land? She could have repented right there. She didn't. Yes, liar. She replied, that was the price. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The youth group who buried your husband are just outside the door and they will carry you out too. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out. I guess they didn't use a sheet that time. Carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. I want you to read verse 11. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. Verse 12, the apostles were performing miraculous signs and wonders among the people. All the believers were meeting regularly in the temple, the area known as Solomon's Colonnade. No one dared join them, verse 13, even though all the people had great regard for them. Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord, the crowds, both men and women. Results of the apostles' work, sick people were brought to the streets and the beds and mats. The Peter's shadow fell across some of them and as they went by. And crowds came in villages in Jerusalem, around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Move in great power, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you look at Acts chapter 19, you'll see that Paul does unusual miracles through the hands of the apostle Paul. And then there's this group of people, they were Jewish exorcists. And Jews would go about in their tradition of casting out devils, but these Jewish exorcists, the sons of Sceva, heard that there's a new way to do it. And if you use the name of Jesus, it has great power and people will be set free. And so they're doing that. Come on, let's go there. Let's go to Acts 19. So they're casting out devils. Casting out devils is normal Christianity. The truth is, if devils aren't being cast out, it means that there still are some. But they are. Verse 11 of Acts 19, 
unusual miracles, handkerchiefs. Okay, verse 13, a group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits or devils, same thing, New Living Version. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation. I command you <laughs> in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time, in other words, they were doing it more than one time. Uh, another version says one day, means they were doing it other days. But on this particular day, one time they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus, I know Paul, who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, attacking them with such violence. Everybody say such violence. Such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. And the story of what happened spread quickly, verse 17, throughout Ephesus to Jews and Greeks alike, and solemn fear, I love that, solemn fear descended on the city. And the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. And many who came, became believers confessed their evil practices and a number of them who practiced sorcery. These are believers who practiced sorcery. It's the same today. Wow. Fear, solemn fear descended on the city. I do believe that America needs a baptism of solemn fear. And it could be that you need one. I'm asking for one. You say, do you have a, a fear of the Lord, which is what I would title that? And I would say, I do. My wife, I think, has probably praised that more than anybody I know. Give us the fear of the Lord. Give us the fear of the Lord. Teach us the fear of the Lord. And a lot of people don't know what the fear of the Lord is. And maybe you don't know, but I'm going to try to define it using Scripture tonight. Acts chapter 5, verse 7 through 11 that we were looking at. They, they didn't give the full amount. It wasn't about how much they gave. The fact that was they were lying to the Holy Spirit. You can't lie to a soap dish and it or the force, but you can lie to a person. And the Holy Spirit's a person. And why did they do that? Because... They didn't have a solemn fear of the Lord. I remember years ago, and I've told this, it's a powerful illustration and it's a true story. There was a um, young kid that was coming to the youth group and he was having a hard time keeping his hands to himself. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not in church, of course, because you had leaders that were there, but at school, and he had a girlfriend, and he decided to, you know, get some prayer from the pastor, the youth pastor, said, can you pray for me? I'm having a hard time controlling my, my urges. And he says, well, yeah, you don't want to be alone. Don't be alone, and just don't do that. That's not good. You need to have the fear of the Lord. And the kid said, okay, and, and the youth pastor prayed for him. Well, as time went on, you know, he didn't grow in the fear of the Lord, and he picked up his girlfriend and drove down to Wasilla Lake. It wasn't Wasilla Lake, but I'm just saying. Drove down to the lake to watch the submarine races. Raise your hand if you know what submarine races are. For all of you that don't know what I'm talking about, it's pretty hard to watch a submarine that's racing underneath the water when you're on the surface. Meaning... So there they are. The father of his girlfriend had been growing in his concern for his daughter and didn't know about anything that was happening but decided to follow. When he found, he found them parked, he pulled his 12-gauge sawed-off shotgun out of the car and uh, tapped on the window of the car. 
as it was steamed up, the boy rolled the window down, and the father said, get your hands off of my daughter. How many of you know his hands retreated very quickly from, from, from touching the girl? Why is that? It would be the fear of the father with his shotgun. The problem with the boy is he didn't have the fear of the Lord. He had the fear of dad after that. It's a true story. The fear of the Lord. Solemn fear. Ananias and Sapphira both get killed. They lie to the Holy Spirit. Because they're trying to be perceived in front of the congregation that they were like, all that. We're just these amazing givers. And they're trying to receive recognition and honor beyond what was due them. It's, it's interesting also because it's open, it's open given. People saw what happened. They laid this, the offering at the apostles' feet. And maybe they told people, almsgiving, you should never tell anybody when you give alms if somebody needs money and you slip them a $100 bill or something and, and you bless them. Don't, you, don't, don't, don't brag on that. It demeans the person you blessed. And you've already received your reward, and you should never brag on that. But there are times of tremendous release of generosity that can encourage a congregation. And uh, my wife and I gave the largest one-time gift that we'd ever given to date. I hope to do better. It's a number of years ago. A couple years ago? It was last year. Feels like a couple years ago. We had money set aside for a, a kitchen renovation, and um, we gave it. We gave 20 grand. Now, that might be a lot for you, but it was a lot for us. It would still be a lot for us. And we gave it. Why would we do that? Because we know that if we don't model, this building wasn't going to happen. And many of you have done the same thing. That's not to gain recognition from you or, or from the Lord. It's just to model what it is to sacrifice. But if I say I gave 20 grand, like I just told you, I gave 20 grand. Guess how much I gave? 20 grand. So I didn't give 15 and just tell you, because that would be like, that would be a sin of Ananias and Sapphira. They didn't have a fear of the Lord. Come on, they didn't have the fear of the Lord. It's interesting, uh, in Joshua chapter 7, Achan, he keeps back. It's the same, the Septuagint, everybody say Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. Say it with me. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. So the book of Joshua, well, the whole, the whole Old Testament is written in Hebrew, except for a section, book of Daniel in Aramaic. And in Joshua 7, the Septuagint, Greek translation, uses the same word, kept back or held back, that which is due to the Lord. Achan held back this wedge of gold, and he ended up destroying himself. What was Achan's problem? Achan was mistaken because he had no fear. He did not have a solemn fear of the Lord. Seven sons of Sceva, same thing. They didn't have the solemn fear of the Lord. So what does it mean to fear the Lord? I'm going to give you a bunch of scripture. All of you note takers should take it Write it down. I love what Evangelist Tiff said. You come to church, you ought to have a notebook, you ought to have a pen, you ought to have a highlighter and have a Bible. And uh, it has certainly been proven that if you will write things down, you'll remember them a little bit better. Psalm 90 and verse 11. Psalm 90, 11. It, it means to fear his anger, the fear of the Lord. What does it mean to fear the Lord? It means to fear his anger. Hebrews 12 and 28, 28, therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God, verse 29 of Hebrews 12, for our God is a consuming fire. In one of the Chronicles of Narnia movies, they're, look, they're, looking out the, the, they're looking out the castle windows at the end of the movie, and Aslan, who's a picture of Christ, is walking away on the beach. And I think it's Lucy says, he's such a kind lion. And then Tumnus says, but he's not tame. 
It's a beautiful picture of God's kindness, but it's not weakness. And a lot of people take God's kindness for weakness. He's not slack, as some count slack is. He's long-suffering. He's patient. It means to hold God in awe. A lot of people have lost the awe of God. Have you lost the awe of God, this mixture of reverence and, uh, and, and godly fear, awe, the awe of God? Don't ever lose your awe. Don't ever lose the awe of God. You can lose it if you lose the awe of God. Great book, I'm part of the way through, by John Bevere called The Awe of God. If you lose the awe of God, you are in trouble. Because then it just becomes ho-hum. And it's just, well, yeah, God. Don't let your kids lose the awe of God. That's why we don't let them play around here. I don't, I don't, I don't let kids play in the altar. So well, I saw some kids playing. Well, I didn't. That's on purpose. Why? Because people get healed right here. People get saved right here. This is where the, the word of God goes forth. This is not a place, and you can be overly uh, religious and weird about it, but at the same time, if you lose the awe and you lose the reverence for an altar call, when there's an altar call, don't go to the bathroom. Wrong time to go. You can wait. Lift your hands to heaven and say, oh, God. Give us solemn fear. Give us the solemn fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to have reverence and, and awe. Psalm 89, verse 7. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints, and he's held in reverence by all those around him. The fear of God means to depart evil. So if you have the fear of the Lord, you're running from evil. You're getting away from it. You're not, you're, not, you're not petting it. You're not looking at it. You're not dancing with it. Thank you, the pastor from Eagle River. Hey, bud. Psalm 89, 7. It is to, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints, and he's held in reverence with all those around him. It means to depart from and hate evil. Proverbs 3, and verse 7. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil or shun evil. Proverbs 8 and 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogance, the evil way, and the perverse mouth I hate. Listen to that. God says he hates perverse, the perverse mouth. If you'll meditate, some of you have a problem cursing. If you'll meditate on that, if you'll meditate on how God hates a perverse mouth and memorize that scripture, you're going to stop cursing. That's just what happens. So I don't know about that. Try it. In fact, you get the word of God on every situation you have in your life where you need healing or it needs to be straightened out and come into alignment with God's word. Memorize God's word, the answer of the challenge you're having. You will find yourself having victory. Why is that? Because his word is sharper than any two-edged sword. God loves and God hates. It means to keep his commands and walk in his ways and obey his voice. Proverbs 14, whoever fears the Lord walks uprightly. Uprightly means to walk in righteousness, to walk in truth, to be, to be good, to be pure. But those who despise him are devious in their ways. 1 Samuel 12 and 14, for all the note takers, if you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and do not rebel against his commands... And if, you, if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord, good. I like that verse. Everybody say good. good. Deuteronomy 10 and verse 12. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Deuteronomy 5 and verse 29, oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me, says the Lord, to keep all my commandments always so that it would go well with them and their children forever. I mean, just think about this for a second. I, I, we clearly know. I'm, I mean, I went out to listen to my son preach, I, and he's been preaching, but, but I really like it. No, I, I don't think you understand what I'm saying. I, I've been pastoring long enough to know that that doesn't always happen. 
Even, even though you might have lived for God and, and walked up brightly and everything, but then your kids, they grow up and sometimes they can lose their minds or they can get defiled and they can go left and they can go right. I know that what's happening out there, my son preaching under an anointing and prophesying over somebody is a great gift from God. It's a great gift from God and I don't take it for granted. And I also know that if I will keep his word and I will walk up rightly, that's, if I didn't walk up rightly, that would not be happening. I understand there's things that happen where you walked up rightly and, it, and the enemy got in there and, it, you know, God help intervene even now for families like that. Oh, that they would incline their ear, would fear me and keep my commands, Deuteronomy 5.29, so that it might go well. I believe it's going well with me and with my children forever. Why? Because because of the fear of the Lord. And I don't claim to have cornered the market on the fear of the Lord. I want to grow. Come on, how many of you want to grow in the fear of the Lord? What a great pastoral word. Psalm 115, verse 11. Bump your neighbor and wake him up. Go ahead. It means to trust him. It means to what? Trust him. Psalm 115, verse 11, you who fear him, trust the Lord. He is their help and shield. It means to serve him. To what? To serve him. Joshua 24, 14, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors. Your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River in Egypt. Serve the Lord. It means to praise and declare his works. Lots of scripture. Okay, what happens when you fear the Lord? That's what it means to fear the Lord. What happens when you do that? Well, personally, a lot of things. It'll help you not to sin. Exodus 20, 20, the Moses said to the people, do not fear, for your God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. But I don't think having a view of God with a sawed-off shotgun is a very good view. When I, think of, when I think of the Lord, I don't think of him with a sawed-off shotgun. But I do understand that, he, that there's blessing, and I understand that there's cursing, and I've made a, a very clear decision in my heart. I want the blessing of God. And it literally everything we do in the Bracken family, the way that we lead this church and this company of people the way that this church is led by Dr. Morocco and all the decisions we make are soaked in prayer. They're based on the word of God and we never do anything where we don't have, an agree we don't have agreement. So I'm, I'm going to be going to Chile to do a power conference. Pastor Karen goes with me every year. It's amazing. We go down there, COVID interrupted, but it's starting again this year. We go down and we have a power conference and it's prophesy over people and flow. And it's, it's a favorite time of the year to go down there to see our friends and we have relationship and our church is down there and the Fregolis. And it's just beautiful to, to, to do that with her. So, you know, here we go this year. We're going, here we go. And Karen's like, uh, like, okay, so we don't book tickets. I'm like, Lord, do you want me to go? I'm like, he's like, you're going. I'm like, amen. Okay. What about Karen? He's like, yeah, pray that through. I mean, I just felt a check. I felt a check in my spirit. It kept persisting. It kept persisting. It kept persisting. And so today, he said, that's it. You're staying back. I'm going. Now, it could have been that the Lord would say, you, I do this for airplanes. I do it for everything. You obey the leading of the Spirit. I, 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 I just fools go where angels fear to tread. If you'll, if you'll have the fear of the Lord, it'll keep you from sin. God will deliver your enemies, deliver you from your enemies, 2 Kings 17, 39. But the Lord your God you shall fear, and he will deliver you from the hand of all your enemies. I mean, that's kind of amazing. You'll have wisdom. Job 28 28, Psalm 111 and verse 10. But I'm going to read Psalm 25, verse 12 and 14. Who is the man that fears the Lord? 
Him shall he teach in the way he, capital H, chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity and his descendants shall inherit the earth. Ooh, listen to this. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. See, God loves everybody the same, but he doesn't talk to everybody the same. Why is that? Because he confides secret, he confides the secret of the Lord, he confides revelation with those who he can trust with it. If you can fear the Lord, then he'll tell you more. So he loves everybody the same, but he has intimate ones. He has people that are intimate. Does he love them more than, than, than others? No, he doesn't. Do they have more favor? Yeah, they do. I mean, that's why some people walk in a greater level of anointing. That's why some people have greater favor. It's not just, you know, oh, God just decided, oh, they're so lucky. Really? Are they? First of all, luck is an Eastern idea. It is not a biblical thought. No, we believe in favor. We believe in the favor of God, the fog. Favor of God. We believe in the favor of God. We believe in having favor with God and favor with man, but that doesn't just happen. He just doesn't throw it out there. The favor of God is released in many different ways, kind of a whole other topic, but the fear of the Lord releases favor, releases blessing. And you can't separate that from being in the Word. The Word of God is irrevocably tied to growing in a relationship with God. So if you're never reading the Word, how are you going to have a greater fear of the Lord? Wisdom. Wisdom is knowledge applied. By wisdom is a house built, by understanding is it furnished. Wisdom, God will give you wisdom. He'll release the secret of the Lord. Come on, lift a hand to heaven and say, oh God, help me to fear your name. Give me solemn fear and speak secrets to me. Woo. You're so lucky, really. I remember years ago seeing some kids, children, I don't know, it was a life group or something, I forget. Little Johnny cleared off the coffee table, smashing all the little, all the little figurines, breaking the glass. I don't have a boy named Johnny. It was somebody else's kid. And they just and just smashed it. And they're like, Johnny, don't do that, Johnny. And uh, <laughs> they tried to control him and you know, and there, there's somebody else's kid sitting there, cross-legged, sketching pictures. And they're like, oh, you're so lucky. Luck. Oh, again, that's an Eastern idea. No. Training. On the hinder parts of their understanding. Repeated pressure applied to their backside in love. And there's other ways. I've known people that, of course, we've known people that have abused children. That's horrible, and that should never happen. But you know what also is abuse? That you don't give your kids consequences for doing something wrong, and then you raise up a, a kid that's got no, you know, no, no conscience for people's special things and clears off coffee tables and you wonder why you have a prison ministry later on when you pastor brian actually a friend of ours pastor brian he pastors our church in lebanon he said this he actually had a friend who said the bible doesn't work he said yeah it does no the bible's a bunch of lies how's that spare the rod spoil the child so i didn't discipline my kid at all and he's a total heathen like, that's not what that scripture means. <laughs> Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. You have to teach them. You have to train them. And it can be done. It needs to be done the right way in righteousness and purity and holiness. Not in anger, not in rage. Thank you. I got another amen from the pastor from Eagle River. Thank you so much. So glad you came tonight. Come on, come on Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. 
My kids obeyed through countless hours, days, months, years, sleepless nights of prayer, intercession, holding the line, saying no a thousand times. I remember getting to the point with one of my children, who will not be named, and I just thought, just go then. Just, just do whatever you want. I just, I just got to that place. And Pastor Vince, you know, thank God for godly people in your life. Pastor Vince, he's a little bit older than me, not much, but he did ahead of the curve in raising children. His children are older than mine. And he said, just hold the line, Pastor. Just hold the line. They just push up against that. Just hold the line. Don't quit. And I've had other friends be like, okay, fine. You don't want to listen to me? Either? I'm tired of fighting you. Go ahead and go with your friends. If you have teenagers, I pray right now for you. Oh, God. Help. I find demon power. I pray God help them. Help, if you have a teenager, lift your hand. I ain't even kidding. Lift. <laughs> Lord, help them. Teach them, about the, teach them about hormones. Teach them about hormones. Man, I'm on it right now. You can put your hands down. What do you mean? Teach them they're going to feel weird. And we taught our kids that helped a little. I remember... I remember Daniel saying, I'm hormonal right now. I'm like, that's okay, son. Come here, let me pray for you. <laughs> hormonal. <laughs> Listen, understand that, you, that, that children's brains are not developed, especially little boys. Neurologically, they're not connected yet. It takes till they're 45. That's not true. It's 50 at least. <laughs> it takes a little while. Pastor Karen's still praying, hallelujah. <laughs> Come on, lift your hands to him. Whoa. Takes into their 20s for a, for a male. It's faster for a female, I think. That's the real statistics on that. But if you fill them full of the word and you teach them to obey because of a moral warehouse, please listen to me, a moral warehouse. They do, what's, they do the right thing based upon God's word, not because their father or their mother said it was right and they're going to lose their allowance and not get the Krispy Kremes that week. No, they do the right thing because this is what God's word says. So when they're out of your house and you're no longer able to hover over them with your, your helicopter and they're now in school, you don't hear at a distance. What was that? Oh, I think that was our son. Because he won't do that. Because he's not obeying because so he doesn't get the Krispy Kreme or whatever. He obeys because it's right in God's sight. You teach them the word. You teach them the word. You teach them the you teach them right and wrong. You teach them the fear of the Lord. And parents need to teach that to their children. Come on, let's get back into this here. Psalm 15. That's good though, right there. Psalm 15, verse 4, who despises a vile person, but honor, but honors those who fear the Lord. You'll be honored. If you learn to fear the Lord, you'll be honored. We all like being honored. If you like being dishonored, you probably have a devil, and we can pray for you at the end of the service. God will have mercy on you. How many of you want mercy? You don't want justice. You want mercy. How many of you want mercy? Mercy, Psalm 103, verse 11. As, a, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. You'll be blessed. Psalm 112, verse 1. Psalm 115, 
verse 13. Psalm 128, verse 4. And Ecclesiastes, I will read to you verse 12 of the 8th chapter of Ecclesiastes. I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God. Going, being well with is blessing. You'll have answers to prayer. Psalm 149, verse 19. He will fulfill the desires of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry. Cry is a picture of prayer and save them. You might have a hindrance to your prayer life because you don't have a healthy fear of the Lord. You'll have a long life. A long life and you'll have, be healthy. Long life, Proverbs 10, verse 27. Fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord prolongs days. But the years of the wicked will be shortened. Malachi 4, 2, but you who fear my name, but you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings and you shall go out and grow fat like a stall-fed calf. You'll be healed. The fear of the Lord, healing is tied to the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord's a vast topic. When you read it, you're like, my, I need all of these things. I need the blessing. I need healing. I need, I need the secret. I need wisdom. Oh, I need favor. Come on, lift your hands to heaven and say, oh, teach me to fear your name. If you've been taking notes, go over these scriptures and let, let them be written on the tablet of your heart. Psalm 25 and verse 12. He'll give you true rest. Who then are those who fear the Lord? Question mark. He will instruct them in the ways they should choose. They'll spend their days in prosperity. Their descendants will inherit the land. And the Lord confides in those who fear him, and he makes his covenant known to them. Your, your seed, your children will inherit the land. My kids are going to inherit the land. What land? I don't know. It's coming from God. Amen. A godly man, a godly woman, leaves an inheritance to his children's children. I was, again, listening to that book by David Green. He's just set up his, he set up his family, he set up his kids, and now his grandkids. That's a good thing. But if you don't teach them wisdom, you don't fear, fear, fear the Lord. How many, how, many, how many families have we seen where they just completely squandered all the wealth, destroyed it, sold the land? You know, it lasts for, I mean, it depends on how much money it was, but they just blow it up all over and end up with nothing back in the same spirit of poverty they had 10 years after they blow millions of dollars. I've seen it. We've seen it. Let me say, I just need money to solve my problem. That's not true. The fear of the Lord will solve your problem. And then God will give you money and he'll help you if you work hard. If you have the fear of the Lord, you work hard. If you have the fear of the Lord, you're on time. That's... Um, Bracken chapter 2, verse 14. <laughs> verse 20, chapter 28, verse 14. Blessed is the one who always trembles before God, but whoever hardens their heart will fall into trouble. Hmm. Proverbs 28, verse 14. So God's speaking to us really simply. Heidi, would I, could you jump on the keys for me? Is that all right, Minister Toby? Thank you. When there's a fear of the Lord, there's true repentance. That's what you see in the text we read. There wasn't, there wasn't true repentance until they saw that bad things happen if you don't go all the way with God. We need a baptism of solemn, of the solemn fear of the Lord in America. You say, well, Pastor, why, why, are, why are the Democrats able to get away with all that? Why are the Republicans? You thought I was going to stop there. I'm not stopping there. Why are the Republicans able to get away with all that? Why is all the political people, and not all political people are evil. We know someone who fears the Lord wonderfully and has for decades. Mayor Edna and Noel DeVries, we love you. Thank you. Why is that able to happen at the, at the highest level, a two-tier system? And 
because there's no fear of the Lord. But make no mistake about it, there will be one day. But I pray for a great awakening in America that true repentance would take place. Acts 19, verse 18, and many believed, many. They saw the sons of Sceva. They came and they burned all of their magic scrolls. Believers. Believers burned their, their magic scrolls. Listen, if you have magic scrolls, you should get rid of them. There was a pastor in Texas ministering to a very wealthy couple. They were having a hard time in their marriage and at their house, and he invited them to come over. We drove out to their, their ranch, beautiful, massive estate in Texas, and drove on to the property and began to feel like a darkness and got into the house. They were relatively new believers. And he started seeing all these idols all over the place, like massive idols, jade idols, idols from all over. And the pastor gathered them together and said, you know, you guys got to get rid of this. You can't just have idols in your house like this. That's your, your Christians now. He said, okay, well, what, what do we do? He said, we're going to get rid of them. And he had a lake in the back, you know, in the back 40. So they loaded up the, they loaded up the, you know, the wheeler, the machine, and one of those ones that has a little bed in the back, and just loaded it up with all the little idols. And his wife, the man's wife, was upstairs just praying. And so this pastor and the, and the husband, they gathered all the idols around and they put it in the back of the, the wheeler and they drove it out to the lake. And they began to throw these things in the lake. And with every throw into the lake went these idols. They, he began to feel better and better and better. And when they threw the last one, they heard a scream from across the property. So they quick raced over and his wife was downstairs, eyes like this big, said, what happened? Something broke. I heard a loud sound and it broke. Do you know that all of that heaviness over their home, all of that, all of that demonic assignment over their house is broken. Some of you, some of you need to throw some stuff in the lake. I said, some of you need to throw some stuff in the lake. Some of you got pictures of your old girlfriend. You got jewelry that you should get rid of. I mean, what do you do if you got jewelry that you should get rid of that was given to you by, by uh, Steve, your, your uh, Bubba, your, your, your old fling? Said, I'm just going to get rid of it. Let me just tell, let me tell you. You can bring it to a pawn shop, sell it, take the money and drop it in the offering. You don't have to throw it out. Amen. Come on, you can redeem that. But there's things that you wear that remind you. It, it's not good to wear, but it's worth a lot of money. Get rid of it. It's got an attachment to it. And many people hold on to stuff because they don't understand the assignment of, of darkness on that defilement. True repentance needs to take place. There'll be a release of miracle power. I think one of the reasons we're seeing so many healings and miracles is because we're beginning to grow in the fear of the Lord. Come on, lift your hands to heaven. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast and it's enriched you and helped you in your life. If you've never made a decision to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you do it now? Pray this prayer with me right out loud. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die in my place. Thank you that he rose again from the grave for me. Forgive me of all of my sin. Wash me, cleanse me, and make me new. Thank you for loving me, and thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Let me pray for you. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would touch each and every person that prayed that prayer out of sincerity of heart. I pray a breaking off of every assignment of darkness, any chain, any bondage, any habit that's not of God, that you would sever it and set them free. I pray and ask Holy Spirit, touch them and fill them now and use them for your purpose and give them a hunger for your word and for the things of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, text us, would you, so that we can help you grow in the things of God text SAVED 
to the number 907 357 2065. If you don't have a home church, we hope that you would find a home with us here at Kings, Alaska. If you're in some other part of the nation or the world, find a good local church that preaches and teaches God's word and grow in the things of God. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you in future broadcasts or in services. Praise the Lord.